My name's Alex Clem. I'm with Unite the Union. Uh, and I'm standing in for Mary Muldowney, who would be known to many of you um, as one of the foremost oral historians. And it's really in it's, it's useful uh, to actually have this session in the context of a labor history conference because oral history has a particular utility in bringing out working class histories and histories from below. And our speakers today, Ida Milne and Tim Strangleman, have shed new light on those histories from below. We were also hoping to have Joe Mooney of the East Wall History Group uh, talking about his work on Dockers, but unfortunately he's had a family health emergency. But I think we'll all look forward to um, hearing him again talk about, about his work on that. Dr. Ida Milne lectures in European history at Carlo College. Many of us will be familiar with her oral history work on the 1919 influenza pandemic, which had a sort of a resurgence there a few years ago. Ida, I think you were on pretty much every radio program. And together with Mary Muldowney, she also uh, coordinated the Alternative Visions project on the 1913 lockout. Professor Tim St Strangleman teaches at the University of Kent. He's a regular contributor to the Working Class Perspectives blog, where he writes about class and labor. And in the words of a recent post, the possibilities of workers fashioning a new version of working class agency. We were hoping that Ida and Tim would give presentations of about 20 to 25 minutes each, followed by a general discussion. And I'm going to ask Ida to start off. She's going to be talking about industrial relations in the Irish Independent. And I think this is particularly interesting because there hasn't been much work looking at media outlets as workplaces and places of workers uh, rather than purely in the context of journalism. And I think that Ida's presentation might have a particular resonance in light of current events in RTE. Ida? Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for that introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here with Tim, who's done such fine work on Guinness. And um, I'm quite sad that Joe Mooney can't be here. He was to share this panel with us as well. And also thank you to Mary Muldowney for organizing this session. Oral histories of the newspaper business are relatively rare and tend to focus on journalism and management. At newspapers from 1925 to 2004. And the site where the Irish Independent, Evening Herald, and Sunday Independent were published. It was, in full declaration, a company I worked for for 20 years before being made redundant in 2000. And that uh, redundancy money I reinvested in my third level education. So nothing is ever lost. Independent House was um, a labyrinthine block of linked buildings stretching from Middle Abbey Street back to Princess Street, where the vans queued to collect the newspapers for distribution alongside the D GPO. And that was always the most exciting time of newspaper production when the presses rolled into action and the vans rushed off to distribute the newspapers around the country. Three relatively large groups of employees, the journalists, the clerks, and the printers, dominated trade and trade union relationships within the company when I joined in 1980. Each group zealously guarded their own areas of expertise, wary of encroachment on tasks under their control from other groups and through changes planned by management. They shared, however, the thrill of working for a newspaper group, the smell of the ink, the rumble of the presses, the, that mad dash of the distribution vans, and the feeling that your work was a small part of history, no matter what function you performed in the building. Rita Doyle, who started working in Independent House at the age of 16, moving from advertising to accounts and finally to personnel, expressed a typical staff sentiment. I love go going into that building, going up the steps every day with the plaque for the nation on the wall, the sense that of history that you would go up the steps, that you are part of that history. The nation, of course, was founded by Charles Gavin Duffy, Thomas Davis, and John Blake Dillon, and, print, and printed in that premises. A list of the permanent staff of independent newspapers in 1966 shows that over 1,200 people worked for the company then, 
Since 1988, with the introduction of new technologies, outsourcing and rationalization, many of these jobs have become obsolete. A comparative list from 2012 shows 360 jobs remaining between the new premises in Talbot Street and the new print plant at City West, with staff numbers reduced through a series of redundancy measures from the 1980s and 2004. Printing and clerical staffs were virtually wiped out by new technology and outsourcing. In 1966, there were 265 printers. By 2012, the company employed six untrained printers in the City West facility. The functions previously held by printers either being taken over by new technology or by journalists. Most of the functions of the clerical staff, including advertising and credit control, were outsourced by 2012. During the early 1980s, 200 permanent clerical staff were there in the building, as well as many, many temps. Between 1966 and 2012, the editorial staff actually increased uh, to 180 permanent journalists across the three titles, even though sub-editing had been outsourced. There were two features of the workforce there that surprised me somewhat. I didn't come from an urban background. Um, I grew up on a farm, so working in any industry or business was quite different to me, but particularly in something like the newspaper with so many networks. But the first was that it had an extremely complex hierarchy. And the second, that that hierarchy was really heavily gendered. These issues of an internal class structure or elitism and the gendering of jobs arose frequently in the, I think, approximately 30 interviews I did with independent staff. If you ask the various staffs within the independent whether there was an internal class stratification or hierarchy, they'll tell you most emphatically that there was, but they'll disagree vehemently on the structure of the hierarchy. Retired financial journalist Martin Fitzpatrick described it half in jest as being a caste system in the house so deep-seated that it would embarrass a Maharaja. The clerical staff I interviewed told me that journalists thought they were the elite, but that the printers really were the ultimate power until the 1990s. Printers' power rested mainly on the value of their work, as they had skills that trained, untrained operatives couldn't step in and replace, and their pay levels reflected their power. They were the best paid large group within the house, easily outstripping the pay of the journalist, the next down on the ladder of the in-house elites. Pauline Marr, who used to work in the works office, calculating printers' weekly pay based on the returns of their keystrokes, said that a printer's basic salary was only a notional indication of their actual pay, as they could often double their salary and overtime. Marr said, the print union were the most powerful union in the house. If they stopped, there was no paper. After that, it was probably the journalists. The advertising end was important also, she said, valued because of the money they brought in. Strong union leaders on the print side tended to be promoted to middle and then senior management. And it was rare in the O'Reilly era for a manager to be appointed from outside the company, something that other companies and new companies found quite perplexing. Um, and as Pauline Maher and Seamus Dooley, the Irish secretary of the NUJ and a former Irish independent sub-editor pointed out, it was a real reflection of printer's power. Two printers I interviewed, Des Mackin and Jimmy Tierney, pointed to the long apprenticeship printers had to go through to justify this status. They couldn't even get married without permission from, from, from their master. And that no other group within the house had training as long or as thorough as that, even journalists who until the late 1980s had at best a two-year certificate course from the Rathmines College of Commerce, which I did myself. Fitzpatrick and journalist Claire Grady both spoke of the fear of being censured by a printer for lifting pieces of lead in the case room. Printers had a mantra that if a non-printer crossed the union divide and touched that type, they'd say, touch that lead again and we're out, and they really meant it. Rookie journalists were often warned about it by their superiors, many of whom would rush in and go to lift a piece of, of lead in a tray when under serious pressure to get a paper out. Deadlines in the newspaper industry were a very serious business as they cost sales and handed them over to your rivals. Journalist Justine McCarthy, now with the Irish Times, observed that it was a very hierarchical organisation. She worked there from 1980 uh, for about 20 years. She said that everyone seemed to look down on copy boys. Copy boys, in theory, were supposed to move um, paper for print on its journey to the case room where it would be set. 
um, for example, from the newsroom to the subs room and from there to the case room. But in practice, they ran errands for everybody who wasn't a copyright around the house. The term was considered so derogatory that independent newspapers dropped it in favour of office services in the 1980s. Uh, many of the copy boys were mature men, but many senior editorial personnel, including the legendary news editor and later editor Vinnie Doyle, began their journalistic careers as copy boys, Doyle and Burke in the old Irish press at the age of 16. Several of the interviews given by the clerical staff showed that they felt journalists thought they were the most important in the industry, more important than anybody else in the house, and didn't understand that the other staffs were also important. Claire Kerwin, who worked in advertising features, said they seemed to forget that advertising paid their wages. This view was reflected by some of the journalists uh, I interviewed too. There was a strong genderization of the workforce in this period. The printing staff in independent newspapers remained a male domain right up to the end. The print union itself didn't admit women until the late 1970s. The machine hall staff who maintained the giant printing presses at the core of the building were all male, and so were most of the dispatch staff and the copy boys. The news sub-editing staff of the Irish Independent was exclusively male until the early 1980s when Sheila Wayman was appointed to the news sub-editing staff and she remained the only female in the department for many years. There was a suggestion that the hours the night sub-editors had to work might have been viewed as being unsuitable for female workers as some of them, particularly the stone sub-editors, worked until the newspaper went to print about one or two in the morning. And yet the night tele ads staff, some of whom perform similar, similar functions to stone sub-editors while working with advertising copy, were both male and female and also worked until one in the morning without any issue. The day tele ads and front counter staffs were predominantly female, but most of the advertising reps were male and the rep, um, advertising rep job had more responsibility, but it also had more perks such as a company car. Copy taking, the typing of news or sports copy read over the phone by reporters out in the job, was almost invariably done by women, unless a news editor anxiously jumped in to assist on significant stories where he, and until the 1900s it always was he, could expedite the writing of the story with the reporter online. Copy takers, in theory, were not trained as journalists, and, but they often had to nursemaid, uh, cub, or even um, reporters with the worst for wear out in the marking, helping them out with flaws in their stories. And this was one of those curious in-house anomalies that was not rewarded monetarily, but earned the gratitude of both the news editors and the rescued party. The sports department remained almost exclusively male, with only one female staff writer and one female sub-editor in this period. Claire Grady said that in all her career at independent newspapers, there'd been only one female staff photographer. Claire is one of a small number of women to be appointed to executive positions within the group uh, during this period. She has shattered several glass ceilings, becoming the first female editor of the Evening Herald in 1912, or sorry, 2012, she's not that old, and being appointed editor of the flagship title, The Irish Independent, in 2013. Anne Harris became Sunday Independent editor after the death of Angus Fanning. Grady said that female journalists typically started out as freelance news reporters answering to the news editor and that they then typically tended to get staffed as writers in the features departments, sometimes under a female features editor. Justine McCarthy worked in independent newspapers as a features writer on the Irish Independent. She said when she went in there were very few women on the independent staff and that they were pigeonholed into areas that were viewed as being suitable for women like feature writing or what was then very common, a woman's page. McCarthy said we were very much writers, not journalists or reporters. We were supposed to go out and do the colour markings. That was considered the girl's beat. The men went out to do the hard news and the sport. Marking was a term uh, for covering an event away from an office and the colour marking was something that would be written not as a straight news story. Unions were also dominated by men. To a lesser extent, the clerical union, the FWI later sipped to. Uh, Rita Doyle um, spoke of the active union roles she and other women had played within the clerical unions. And Seamus Dooley said that in contrast, women had never been to the forefront of union activity within the other unions at Independent House. 
as there was no female printers, there was obviously no female print union officers, and women were really poorly represented in the senior ranks of the Independent House NUJ Chapel, even when women journalists were to the fore in founding um, the Irish Women's Liberation Movement. Do Dooley says sub-editors traditionally provided the backbone of the Indo Chapel, and he reckoned this was why women were virtually absent from the NUJ Chapel authorship officership until recent years. And he said, yet senior journalists, including Claire Grady and Catherine Donnelly, have served on the NUJ Equality Committee. Dooley also made the point that when the Sunday Independent star crime reporter, Veronica Guerin, was murdered in 1966, sorry, 1996, she had not been staffed, even though her work was a key feature of the Sunday Independent at the time. Dooley said, I remember feeling angry. Veronica was a freelance journalist. She was never given a staff job. Like so many women, she struggled for security as a freelance. Uh, freelancers always had it tough, and women freelancers even tougher. And indeed, that's the reason why I, even though I'd trained as a journalist init initially, uh, when I was asked to go on the freelance staff of the Independent, say, or given the choice of working in the clerical union, it was a no-brainer in the early 1980s because the recession made everything so expensive. And you had six weeks holidays, a four-day week, and really good pay um, on, on, on the clerical staff. So. The values and changes to the workforce force in independent newspapers in the period reflected, if only gradually, the values and changes in the wider political world which the group's titles chronicled. When the clerical staff in independent newspapers were being out wiped out by outsourcing and redundancy, associated redundancies over the last 14 years, there has been real change in terms of more equality for women within the editorial staff. And female journalists you'll talk to, do, to today are really shocked at the position of female journalists in the past. Martin Fitzpatrick spoke of going to Finland in the mid 70s and visiting a newspaper in the Ar Ar Arctic Circle. He said, they were, there we were introduced to a female sub-editor, something that didn't happen back at home. I remember the su surprise and astonishment that such a rare creature existed. He said, a few years later, the numbers of women coming into the industry as journalists was extraordinary. And at the time of his interview, two of the three editors of the Indo titles were women and we all suddenly grew up. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Ida, that was fascinating, particularly on the internal class structures and gendering in the Indo. I hope, is that going to become a paper that we can? Good, I'll be looking out for it. Uh, Tim Strangleman is going to talk to us about his work on an oral history of the Guinness Park Royal Brewery in London. And I have to admit, I didn't know there was a Guinness Brewery in London. Uh, and he's going to examine the experience of industrial change over the 20th century, something which obviously is of increasing relevance today as well. Tim. Yep. Just to say, Christmas is coming. It's a very reasonably priced book. Okay, um, I've got loads of pictures, um, so I just wanted to tell you a bit about the project. Um, the, the factory was there from, or the brewery was there from 1936 through to 2005 when it closed down and then it was pulled down and I'll show you some pictures there. Um, I came to work in there purely by accident, I was involved in a project looking at older male workers um, and Guinness at the time because it had been through a series of downsizings. Um, contained lots of older male workers, uh, and therefore, um, the, uh, then I broached uh, the project with the, uh, their manager to do a oral history and photographic project. Um, so I just want to talk, talk about some of those things. Um, so I started researching in 2004. Um, the closure occurred in June 2005, and I did oral histories and worked with a photographer through that period. Um, and this was um, inspired by um, an American book, Closing the Life and Death of an American Factory. Um, and I tr did that and then some, because basically discovered there was a huge um, uh, photographic archive uh, in the uh, archives in Scotland, as well as Dublin. Um, I won't go into why there a, there's a, uh, was an archive in Scotland part of the Diageo archive. Um, so I've done various things with that, culminating in the book. 
Um, I use 30 plus oral histories, actually there were a lot more than that. Um, archive work in um, Scotland and Dublin. This is an aerial picture of Park Royal. Um, that's no longer there. If you imagine you're looking in towards the city, it's quite a way out. It's on the outer inner suburbs of London. Um, originally been being told uh, when, when I went up to the archive in Scotland uh, in Menstry um, that there were only five boxes and the archivist was wonderful and she said I hope you haven't wasted your time coming all the way from London um, and then uh, subsequently when I did some research there were something like 60 archive boxes of photography basically because the archive wasn't particularly it was it was marginal to Diageo's interest which is more some of the whiskies uh, and spirits so I used uh, oral histories, companies, magazines, and these wonderful pictures. Uh, the archive is wonderful. I could tell you loads about that, which includes a fish on a bicycle, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and really what I wanted to say, and I am going to rush through this because this is 15 years worth of work, so, and I've got 20 minutes. Um, I've used uh, Lucien Goldman's idea of privilege occasion because I think Park Royal offers a cup into how we think about work in the 20th and early 21st century. It tells uh, an amazing story of how work was understood by organizations, by workers, by unions, but it also, Park Royal sits on these kind of ley lines of history. Um, don't worry, I'm not going all spiritual on you. Um, uh, but it tells the story of work in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, and I wanted to tell the story of one site uh, pre-cradle to post-grave. I'm interested in uh, deindustrialization. Um, Hugh, Hugh Beaver is a very interesting uh, guy. He was a managing director involved in the building of Park Royal. And he explained when um, Giles Gilbert Scott, the architect, um, died in his obituary in the Guinness magazine for staff, he said the board talking about why it was built, the board decided we'd wish to have a building that would outlive the taste of the moment, something that would not attempt to hitch onto the latest mode or set a new pattern, that would not try to seem anything else than a large, efficient factory, built firmly and solidly to last a century or two as the company already last, its, uh, last itself. I want to get the sense of, um, they, were th they were thinking in centuries, they were, their, their timeline was centuries, their horizon was centuries. Uh, I know the Guinness Brewery here has a, um, a lease of 10,000 years, I think. Um, so it's not used much so far. Um, but that's the sort of way in which capital is thinking. So why is the brewery there? The brewery was there because uh, Anglo-Irish trade war was threatening to break out in the late 1920s, early 1930s. The British government tipped off the Guinness uh, board that they were going to impose or threatening to impose tariffs on Guinness imported from Ireland. So therefore, in complete secrecy, including um, spiriting away uh, Guinness uh, senior people to London, they built a factory in secret. Uh, huge factories you've just seen. Um, they built it, uh, they put rumors around that this was uh, for war work, making munitions from potatoes or making bicycles. Um, but they managed to keep it secret. Obviously, people could see it being built, but they didn't know what the purpose of it was until pretty much production started in 1936. Um, it was built very, in a very modern way, um, but uh, it imported all the worst uh, production techniques from Dublin to the point when they were trying to make the Guinness uh, taste the same. Um, they'd managed to import some of the microbes from Guinness because you used wooden vessels. Um, uh, stainless steel was quite common in, in uh, Europe. Um, I won't go into, J.B. Priestley talks about the, uh, the area. Um, this is what um, uh, eventually was um, uh, created in, in uh, West London. The point about this was they had a big debate about what the building was going to look like. They employed Charles Gilbert Scott, the premier. He's the president of the British uh, Institute of Architects at the time, known for marrying modern, modernity and tradition. But also, they, they create a huge parkland around the um, brewery. 3,000 shrubs were planted, uh, several thousand trees. And my point is, they did this not because they had to, but because they wanted to. So there's a kind of sense of what corporate pride was about. I won't go 
into that. But the archive is full of lots of different um, uh, pictures. Um, they had a cottage, cottage garden where they grew, um, uh, well, it's not, that looks like a farm to me, <laughs> where they grew all the um, uh, 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 food for the canteens. Um, especially during the war, it became very important. Um, the archive is also full of lots of different pictures, and I'm using lots of images, and I use uh, images as in interchangeable between visual images and oral history and other archive material. Um, this was a, uh, a picture John Gilroy uh, did of the Trusso ceremony where Apprentice Cooper was um, ceremonial ceremonially um, put through, but when he came out of his um, apprenticeship, um, he was thrown in the barrel, loads of stuff was put in. You can see there, um, the guy with the bucket is about to put it on the uh, apprentice Cooper. He was then rolled around the cooperage, uh, and then um, uh, uh, he emerged like some uh, butterfly from the chrysalis. You can just about make out, these, these, these were his parents, uh, you can also see his fellow workers, uh, and th there's lots of other stuff I could, I could um, go and know that. So it's not as, as clear as it is here. So what you've also got is some stunning pictures. These pictures were taken in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and they were taken by uh, a guy called A.R. Tanner. A.R. Tanner had worked for um, uh, Life magazine uh, before the war. During the war, he's in the British Army Photographic Union uh, unit, goes across uh, Europe from D-Day, and also takes pictures I've seen of the liberation of the death camps. Comes back and starts a business taking um, corporate photography and creates these beautiful images, um, absolutely stunning in the original. Um, again, it reflects uh, a value put on work and dignity of labor. However cliched you might think, these are beautiful pictures of labor. Um, highly staged, of course, but very, very beautiful pictures nonetheless. So the archive is full of this. This is women um, uh, scrubbing out the insides of um, barrels. The point about here is every single piece of labor done on this site was carried out by pure Guinness workers. That, that they, they were, there was no outsourcing of work. The only people that weren't employed by Guinness uh, worked in advertising in central London and the photographers who took these pictures. Um, uh, Terence Cuneo uh, was employed in both Dublin and in Park Royal to take these, uh, make these beautiful um, uh, poster images. And these are identifiable workers at the Park Royal site. Um, the archive shows division of labor, uh, trades going on. Um, they were taken for various uh, reasons to uh, portray, portray work. Um, Guinness had its own uh, power station, its own fire brigade and ambulance station. So I'm trying to get across, this is a company that was entirely self-contained. It was a self-contained unit of itself. Um, this is a lovely picture. You can actually see the cropping lines uh, here of the photo. Um, this is workers buying the first edition in 1947 of the Guinness Time magazine that was internally created. Beautiful, wonderful magazine uh, that lasted for 30 years. And this is the workers in one of the six canteens, silver service, um, uh, that workers sat down to their free meal every day. Um, reading, avidly reading Guinness Time in uh, 1947. Um, it had its own, uh, Lord Iver had a, a, a prize earning herd of cows. So it's just again, anyway. My point here is that Guinness um, sits on the ley lines of corporate history. Uh, it's like many companies, it's uh, a benign employer, often paternalistic, until the 1980s, and this guy in the center holding the book up is Ernest Saunders, who many of you know about. So Guinness sits at the point of the, the biggest corporate scandal in the UK in the 1980s. So, and I could go in about that. So, fast forward to 2004, 2005, when I'm working with a photographer, and I say to the photographer, can you take some pictures of work going on? And he said, 
what do you want me to take? And I said, well, people doing work. And he said, he takes pictures in the canteen here. These women had uh, only recently been outsourced. Uh, so they worked for a uh, company. So when Guinness closed, these workers with something like 30 years seniority didn't get any uh, compensation because they worked for a private contractor. Um, we said to the manager, right, we'd like to talk to all the workers and, and we said about the cleaning workers and he said, why would you want to talk to them? Um, they were Portuguese migrant workers at the time and he said, they're not Guinness workers. And it's a really interesting idea about how work is valued. Equally, transport and logistics was all outsourced. Uh, this is a young guy. Some of the guys had been uh, sacked and rehired uh, three or four times as the company, uh, logistics company had changed. Um, so this represents one shift. Uh, workers worked in the end 12-hour shifts uh, and then had four days off. Um, and this represents a crew um, where once there had been 1,500 workers on site, this was uh, what they were reduced to in the end. And then you had outsource workers. Um, so how am I doing for time? Great. Um, so I, I was talking to some of the workers who were about to may, be made redundant, um, and they were talking. They, it, it was a, it was an instance where they reflected on their own work, but they also talked about um, their relationship with their kids and their experience of work. Um, and it, this is a guy who'd worked for Guinness for 30 years, and he's talking about his son, who's a graduate, um, working. Um, he had two sons. One worked solidly for Nestle and then got made redundant. The other one had flipped about, and he was very frustrated by his son who flipped about, would never settle. And he said, his experience, I suppose, is the same as mine, but a bit earlier. He did 11 years at Nestle, and what they've been doing there is what we've been doing, is cutting a number uh, year after year. So he was made redundant in February this year. We talked about it a fair bit, because Nestle, again, even there, there was a culture. You joined a company, and you... One of the things I've tried to encourage them is not to get quite stuck in the groove. Robert has been forced to think about this because he was made redundant from uh, uh, Nestle with Steve, and it's the other thing. I wish he could stay a little bit longer with each company, but yes, we talk a lot about work. We talk a lot about redundancy. Where he came to in the end, I think was interesting, was Stephen had got it right because he hadn't committed, he hadn't invested, he hadn't embedded himself and therefore made himself vulnerable. So it's... It, it, it was he, was, he was as a father thinking, what advice can I give to my sons about what work is? Um, and another worker said, coming from Ireland, my parents uh, sort of, like, sort of idolised the word Guinness. It was a great reputation in Ireland as well. Um, uh, I would recommend Guinness to anyone. I didn't like the change to Diageo, the holding company. But also I learned a lot. Um, that, uh, if, you, that if you're in a comfort zone, you have to be very careful because you might not last too long. I've learned a lot here over 35 years. Uh, if I say to my kids, if I could give them one reasonable piece of advice, it would be never become complacent because if you do, you're going to be in for a shock. And again, the stability that he'd known now no longer offered a, 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 a model for advice. Again, uh, the Guinness Brewery, because it was designed by Giles Gilbert Scott, makes uh, a lot of um, waves when it's uh, Diageo want to pull it down. They want, rather than use it for some other purpose, repurpose it, um, they um, uh, pull it down, they, um, they, they put in to have an application to have it uh, demolished. And it causes a stir in the architectural press because it, is, it should have been a listed building. Um, so you can see to the coming together of the value of architecture and industrial architecture. Um, this was a place that was supposed to last a century or two. Um, I won't, um, I'll wrap up because I haven't got time. But basically I interviewed a lot of workers about how they felt about the buildings being pulled down. And there was kind of mixture between sadness and loss, but also recognition that there was nothing they could do about it. And, and they'd rather it be pulled down than just go into gradual decline. Uh, I also 
had um, uh, worked with a guy who talked, uh, took these pictures of the um, buildings being pulled down. It took them longer to pull it down than it did to actually build it in the first place. Uh, and I interviewed one of the workers um, that did the photograph here. I won't do this. But almost from pre-cradle to post-grave, you've got the rise and fall of this building. And you, you, I, used, I gave these um, photos that I took um, to the 20th Century Society because they found it very valuable to see what was inside a building such as this of its e e era. Um, Terry Aldridge had been made redundant 10 years before the uh, closure. And uh, I said to him, why did you go back? And he photographed the buildings being pulled down. And he said, curiosity, I suppose, you can't help but go back there. He said he wouldn't go back to his previous work site, but he, he wanted to go back there to, to mark a place that he'd found value in. And it's really interesting when you think about false consciousness, uh, uh, um, uh, this idea that you know, people are kind of um, alienated from the workplace. He goes back there to collect memories. Um, and he said he was sad, and I said, but what he's doing is animating the buildings as they're being pulled down with memory. And he articulates that through the interview. He's remembering having water fights uh, during the 1970s. Um, I'll just sort of wrap it up here. Um, th the images that we put up and then other people put up um, stimulated a whole series of debates. So uh, this place, um, it was subject to urban explorers before it's pulled down. Um, and this elicited, I went back when I was reading, uh, writing the book, um, and there were like dozens and dozens of uh, pe people who posted their memories of the site through these pictures. Um, and really what it was a debate about was, why can't work be like that anymore? Why can't the work that we enjoyed in the 1970s and 1960s be like that now? I, I won't read out these. Um, but there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of um, uh, goodwill towards the Guinness family and members of the Guinness family, not so much for uh, what, what Guinness had become. So um, I'll just wrap up, really. Um, so this really was a privileged occasion for understanding work and organization. You go from a, an organization that is entirely uh, horizontal and vertically integrated to one where virtually everything is outsourced. Um, Guinness had worked very hard after the Second World War to create what they called industrial citizenship or Guinness citizenship. They really did care that workers became their best selves. Um, I've been criticized for being romantic at that, and I'd, I'd explain that in the, in the book. But one of the things I'd put to people is, what, what do we want from organizations? Um, and in some senses, the book is, is trying to posit a different way of doing capitalism or a different way of doing uh, work and organization. Um, it, in the UK, the idea of the long boom, um, the book elicits uh, notions of what the long boom, the memory of the long boom, which I don't think really we have enough knowledge about um, uh, um, and thinking about how people embedded themselves and worked uh, and were attached to their work. And I just wanted to say this is the this is the badge that was on top, or, or, or on the front of the last brew that went down the line, and I got some of them. Um, on the back was a label where they could list every single worker who worked at Park Royal, and there were just 80 of them in the end. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. That was fascinating and definitely another one for the reading list. I think we probably have uh, time for two rounds of questions. I'm just looking at some. Are we okay for time? Yes. And if um, people could give their name, but then also say whether your question is for Ida or Tim, and we'll take them then sort of in two groups if that works. Could I? Could I take the privilege of holding the microphone yes. to ask a question of my own? Yes, of course. Very, very quickly. I'm, I'm the grandson and the great-grandson of two employees of Uncle Arthur here in James's Gate. And in fact, my grandfather was dismissed from Guinnesses because he participated in what they call in the archives the Sinn Féin Rebellion. Uh, so 
I just wanted to ask Tim uh, very quickly. Uh, Park Royal was an iconic part of London, uh, and I spent a number of years as a child in London and was very familiar with, with the name Park Royal. Is, is its sudden and rather and very sad demise not a lesson for us here in Dublin? Because uh, it indicates that there is really no sentiment in companies for buildings. Uh, and St. James's Gate, uh, without, without St. James's Gate, Dublin would be uh, uh, almost a desert. Uh, and a quick question for Ida, if I might, because my father was uh, in the newspaper industry and was advertisement manager of the Irish Times at one stage. Uh, there was a real cleft between advertising and editorial. Would you agree? No. Sorry. Have you Yes. Thanks. Uh, Paddy Smith. Um, I'm a former father of the chapel of the Irish Times NUJ and a former member of the executive of the NUJ. I, I, I thought your Ida's presentation in particular was very interesting and uh, it reflects uh, the, the, the structure and the psychology, if you like, of the workplace uh, of the independent reflects very much the same uh, as, as the Irish Times. And if you're going to go on and do the Irish Times, um, I think you, you would find very many common themes. Um, I, I would say uh, a couple of things, though. And I, I think it, they, it relates to the, uh, what I see as a fundamental change in the balance of forces in the, in the newspaper industry. Uh, in, the, in the early uh, 70s, the unions were a, a really major uh, force in, inside uh, the, the newspaper industry. And we secured really major uh, increases in working conditions and, and, and the like uh, right, across, right across the board. But come the, uh, the economic crisis in uh, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, and the advent of new technology, simultaneously uh, a shift uh, was happening in the economics of newspapers that is, that is so profound that all of these relationships are being turned on, on their heads. And we see that you know, the decline of advertising, the shift to online, the control by online companies of, of the uh, advertising market um, has, has led to very severe pressures on the uh, newspaper industry uh, right across the board from rural, regional press to, to the, na the big nationals. And uh, the, the, if, you, if anything, the unions are now uh, in retreat and in, in, a, in a bad way. There have been job losses, there have been pay cuts uh, that have not been restored with the re reviving of the economy. The, the pandemic, uh, if, if anything, uh, made things worse in terms of the economics of, of newspapers. So the, the um, transformation has been really quite uh, radical, both uh, in, the, in the Irish Times and certainly in the Independent, where, if anything, they've suffered worse from the, the process of, of cutbacks and the like. Unions are there still, but I have to say uh, they are um, tolerated rather than uh, listened to. And, and one of the, the unfortunate reflections of that um, is the unwillingness of younger uh, journalists or, or, or workers to become involved in, in the unions. And the, the, basically the leadership of the unions is also withering. Thanks for that, Paddy. I think there was a question over there as well. Hi, uh, Alan Byrne. Uh, not a member of any organisation, but I do teach in uh, one of the buildings that was built by Lord Iva. Uh, it's now Liberties College. It was formerly a play centre for uh, kids at Dublin. There's uh, uh, just a question for Tim. There's a, you can't say anything bad about Guinness in certain parts of Dublin because of their built heritage, the philanthropy and all that sort of stuff as well. To me, I've only done a little bit of work on the Dublin side, but maybe looking at it a little bit cynically, how much of this do you think was basically to keep unions out of workplaces? And uh, I know a little bit about it in the Dublin context, but in terms of the broader company, and do you think maybe that the outsourcing, again, looking at it kind of cynically, is another way of, of acting in that level? Uh, have you come across any evidence from your work in this about either a positive or a negative view of unions amongst workers? Thanks. Thanks. I think it might be an idea to go back to Tim and Ida before 
Giacomo. On, is it? Great. <laughs> Spot the novice. Um, the advertising and the editorial rift, I think, it, it exists across all, it existed across any newspaper I worked in. I worked in provincial newspapers as well. And um, the tension between advertising and editorial often led to stand up rows, which I'm sure your, your father was well aware of. Uh, Paddy, we could write an entire book or several um, on what, what you commented on the recent changes. And I think, you know, what I was trying to chronicle, and which I probably didn't bring out well enough in, the, in paper, was we moved from the golden era, um, or part of one of the golden eras, early 20s would have been as well, 1920s, um, of newspapers. And the unions were a big part of that, and they enhanced newspaper life immensely, um, both in terms of the way the kind of breaks they put on management, but also because they promoted from within the house and that meant that you knew, had people who actually knew what went on in the house and how each um, sector contributed so strongly uh, to independent newspapers. But the first guy I worked for, a second guy I worked for within independent newspapers was Jack Gilroy, who of course was promoted from, from uh, the print side, a superb orator and later became the works director. And he was key to part of that success possibly key to part of that downfall too, um, or was part of the, the, the end game, I suppose, in it. Um, I think it's a big pity that the people within newspapers now, tend, management, it's owned from without, and it tends not to understand as well, and that independent newspapers is different at the moment, but the, generally the management tends, I'm bluffing that, sorry, sorry, I'm stuttering over this, tends not to understand the business as well as, as, as owners and managers did in the past. I think that would be fair to say. And I think that something that made what I view as the destruction of independent newspapers much more easy was the fact that whopping had already happened. So we thought it was going to be worse. And um, I think people were uh, sort of semi-relieved it wasn't, but it gradually it did become worse within independent newspapers. But the other thing is independent, house, independent newspapers were a commercial outfit, whereas the Irish Times had um, probably more uh, altruistic own ownership. Do you think that's fair to say? And of course, the big loss in, the t in that period too is, is the Irish press group, which made a huge difference to the balance within Irish news media. Very quickly, um, first of all, Alan, thanks for the question. Um, it, Port Royal was very different from Dublin because unions were recognised very, very early on in the 1940s after the war, in part to head off communism, uh, to communist agitation. So they recognised, and this is part of the thing I was talking about, this idea of Guinness citizenship, was they recognised that um, part of uh, the citizenship was that people had the right to organise. And in the brewing industry in the UK, it caused a lot of uh, disturbance amongst other breweries, uh, the big breweries, because they didn't recognise, their industrial relations were pretty poor. Yeah. Um, so the, the London was an outlier, and indeed the London management were criticised by the Dublin management. They ran as quite separate entities, uh, although very connected. Um, why, uh, in, in terms of uh, closure, um, there was a uh, oversupply of Guinness, shrinking population of Guinness drinkers, overcapacity between Dublin and London, and Park Royal was more efficient than Dublin, but they couldn't close down the old uh, iconic um, uh, Dublin brewery. So it's interesting how a brand uh, can't just be outsourced in, in, in a very simple way to the most efficient. The other, way, the other reason was that because the UK government didn't, um, didn't impose all the European labour regulations, it would have been more expensive to sack Irish workers than uh, British workers. Thanks. Do we have more questions? Yeah, just uh, uh, John Horne, um, Emeritus TCD and ILHS. Um, I mean, it strikes me, thanks for both presentations, really, really interesting, and that we have two oral histories of deindustrialization, and I'm very struck um, in the quotes that you gave, um, the importance of emotions, emotions and feelings, and I think there's a really interesting intersection there between 
uh, the feelings of people's lives and these processes of uh, deindustrialization. My question is about museums and the built heritage. I mean, I find it deeply shocking, the demolition of uh, um, Park Gate, but I wondered um, uh, 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 whether in both of your cases, I'd just like your views on what you think the role ought to be of the preservation of the built heritage of the industrial past in terms of labor history. So either in terms of um, Independence House, to what extent is this or should this be, um, have a museum kind of dimension to it? And Tim, I just wondered if you had any views on um, St. James's Gate. I mean, when I visit the Guinness Hop Store, I'm shocked, it's just my personal view, but it seems to me it's just a brand museum for Diageo. It has nothing to do with Guinness. Um, whereas in fact, um, you still have, both in, in the brewery itself, but also the surrounding streets, you have an extraordinary potential for social history of labor in Dublin. And the comparison for me there would be with the Titanic Museum in Belfast, which superbly has built into it a social history of, of, of labor, including women's labor in, in Belfast at the turn of the century as integral to the Titanic Museum. It seems to me there's an enormous potential for doing exactly that, which is ignored, it seems to me, by the current owners of, um, of, of Guinness. And I'd just be interested to have your response to, in the light of your experience in London, what you think might be done in terms of preservation of the built heritage, in terms of labor history of Guinness in Dublin. John, I'm so really glad you asked that question. Um, one of the big difficulties for a newspaper historian is kind of material archives, material culture, and you know, getting things like marking books and things like that. In Independent House, I know for a fact, told to me by some of the interviewees, management threw a lot of the really valuable archives into a big skip and ordered them to be thrown out. And um, Harry Allen, um, who I worked with, told me he got, for example, the 1910s marking book, which included his own grandfather being sent out in markings. And you know that was a list of all the stuff that would have been covered around the time of 1916 during the War of Independent Civil War. Incredible stuff, and um, he rescued that. But you know, there's another document I know I'd love to get my hands on if anybody can. For the 50th anniversary of the Rising, the Independent printed a special edition. It is not, as far as I know, in the National Library. I've looked for it, can't find it, but maybe it's come into being since I looked last but it carries a lot of detail of what happened in the building during the Rising, you know, with the printers having their um, people coming back into the building and finding the, 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 the sub editors books up against the wall with bullet holes through them, you know, where they come through the windows. So if anybody has data, archives belonging to independent newspapers or other newspapers, will you please make sure they get into some kind of archival um, holding place? I would love to see a proper newspaper history museum um, Jack Gilroy and other printers in the Independent set up the Print Museum in Beggar's Bush, which is wonderful, and gave over directly some of our, our old print, um, I forget the name of the, the machines, 1912 printing thing, which are actually still being used in the 1980s when the new technology came in. Um, so I think that, that that's you know wonderful that you've raised that question. Archives and peril are always an issue. And one other thing I'd just like to add out to that, not wanting to hog it from Tim, is that, um, as newspapers themselves are being dumbed down, as they're covering less and less court reports, provincial newspapers in particular, and I know this is something Seamus Dooley will talk about later, um, there are less and less sources for historians to use. Telling the story of COVID uh, 100 years from now will be much more difficult to do through newspapers than I could do from the, the 1918 papers. Just, just on that, um the most valuable source I had was an in-house quarterly magazine called Guinness Time um, that was done to such a high uh, level, a standard. Um, so they would talk across the workforce uh, and they would uh, use quotes from Plato, William Morris, you name it. And they weren't, they were expecting the workforce to know and understand and be able to read and, and think about the, the themes they were using. Um, I'm often accused of being um, nostalgic and romantic. First conference paper I ever gave, I was called romantic. Uh, and I've always been interested in this idea of smokestack nostalgia, where workers are kind of s s criticized for being kind of uh, romantic and rose-tinted about the work they did. Workers are never uh, 
um, critical. And it got me thinking about nostalgia. Nostalgia is always critical because it's always thinking about the past and in relation to the present. Um, uh, in, in terms of the, the records, um, the amount of times I've done projects where records you're working on have been rescued by workers who understand the value of them when the management just saw them as, a, as something that needed to be stored and therefore had no value. Um, um, there was a picture there, the black and white picture was taken by a guy who was uh, checking the rivets. It was pushed into the archive, kept, and I was the first person to un undo it. And there was a, an account written on uh, a piece of scrap paper saying, this was taken five stories up. My job was to check the rivets. It involved me shimming out on, on, on these beams. Very scary, and you had to check rivets with two hands. So he was, he was sort of, and this tiny little fragment, I'd love to have interviewed him, but, um, but, but basically, in terms of built heritage, um, there was a campaign to the architectural historian who I've uh, forgotten that cartoon is about, is, uh, he's actually fe featured in it. Uh, he, was, um, uh, he, he was making the green argument to say, this is a building that was built for two centuries. It has an uh, uh, embedded uh, carbon footprint. Let's use it. And, and it could have been converted. The real estate was more valuable. So if you now go around that site, it's um, a lot of tin sheds that took, I, I say in the book, took a couple of weeks to put up uh, versus something that was built by the premier architect of his day. And again, that says about the value of uh, what, what we place on the built, the built environment. Um, yeah, I won't go on. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have one more question. Uh, Tom Turner. Um, I, in the context of, this is a question about the future, not the past. In the context of the emphasis you put on the kind of identity, solidarity, and um, tradition that workers in Guinness has experienced, and my question really is about the future. And um, you talked about deindustrialization, but actually we may be looking at the end of the workplace, not just deindustrialization, with the development of home working, uh, which is a fairly major policy initiative that's going to develop over the next how long I don't know. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what the future holds in that perspective. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, th I think it's really interesting that um, uh, I studied a place that was open for 70 years, designed for over 200 uh, uh, and workers the, uh, one of the reasons why the workers, I won't say were passive, but uh, uh, accepted redundancies, they were towards the end of their working lives and got very generous payoffs and had a very good pension. Contrast that with the people who now occupy the buildings that are on its place, and on the whole, they are fast food or uh, dark restaurants, I think they're called, people who are on minimum wage, um, whose relationship with work is fugitive at best. They, they won't be on pensions, uh, uh, they won't, they won't uh, have careers. Um, my PhD student uh, was doing a Deliveroo, uh, doing a project on Deliveroo drivers. Their relationship with their work is, is measured in seconds and minutes, not uh, years, decades, uh, and a working life. And that is something I think is a challenge for anyone who's interested in work and labor. How, how do you uh, organize or think about work when you haven't got the ability to embed yourself in it? It's not part of a life cycle where you mature through your work. Your relationship with work is highly fragmented, highly individualized, and is, is measured in seconds and minutes, not weeks, months, years, decades. Thank you, Tim. I'm getting signals that we're going to have to wrap it up, so just to say huge thanks to Tim Strangleman and Ida Milne.